Good afternoon. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Digital Dish, a joint event series of Aspen Institute and Telefonica Germany. My name is Harald Geiwitz, and I'm a representative of Telefonica in Berlin. Until recently, we would all be together right now celebrating this event either in our representative office at Unter den Linden or at the base camp. We look forward to the days where we can have discussions such as the one that we will be holding today in person. Until then, we believe that it is fundamental to adapt to new realities, utilizing digital tools to facilitate discourse on issues revolving around digital policy, especially during this time of uncertainty. Today's topic is the use in relationship with China with regards to future technology. I'm very much looking forward to hearing the diverse perspectives on the subject matter. On the one hand, the academic observations of Professor Amigini and Mr. Lee, the Europolitical views of Mrs. Svenja Hahn, member of the European Parliament, we already know each other from the Telefonica Digital Launch, and from Minister of State Niels Annen. Welcome, Niels, and thank you for your insights into the EU-China issue from the Foreign Office's point of view. Today's topic is both significant and challenging for Telefonica, as we have been caught between all fronts in recent years. Therefore, I am glad that my only duty today is to welcome everyone and not to have to make a substantive contribution. Otherwise, I would have to talk about the surprisingly little political attention, China's rise versus Europe's decline in the field of communications technology has received over the past two decades. Therefore, I eagerly await our experts' discussion on the matter and will give the floor now to the director of the Aspen Institute Germany, Dr. Stormy Annika Mildner. Stormy, thank you very much for our joint collaboration. It is always a pleasure to work with you and your team. I'm looking forward to this and many other discussions to come, hopefully in Berlin Mitte again soon, whenever the circumstances allow. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Harald, for this uh, very well, warm welcome. Indeed, usually we would be at the uh, premises of Telefonica um, for our digital dish um, over the last year. Um, we have to do it differently as today, um, but I'm sure that we will still have a wonderful and deep and insightful debate on EU-China relations with a particular focus um, on tech issues. Uh, so thank you so much again um, to all your colleagues uh, at Telefonica for this collaboration over the last year and um, certainly also for today. Um, I'm Stormy Mildner. Um, I've been with Aspen um, for now um, almost 100 days. Um, <laughs> So I became the director um, at the start of this year, and I have to say um, it's, it's been great fun today, and um, this continues uh, certainly today. As Howard said, um, I think our debate couldn't be more, um, more timely. Um, on the one hand side, uh, because of the elections in the United States um, and uh, the new president, um, Joe Biden, there is a window of opportunity for a new relationship with the United States. Um, on the other hand, there are great, great expect expectations um, across the Atlantic for a restart, but also for collaboration on EU and US-China uh, relations. Um, and at the priority list, right at the, at the top, are tech issues, how we deal with new technologies, how we deal with digitalization. But at the same time, it might not be as easy um, as we would like to see it or as we um, could uh, would like to expect. Because there are still differences with regard to EU-China relations um, among EU member states, um, for example, um, even within um, EU member states, there are differences with regard to how we should approach and deal with China and how we should deal with tech issues. And we had the opportunity um, to discuss these issues last year, um, or even play it through last year, in an EU-China Technologies Summit, uh, which might 
colleagues, uh, Toby Wachewski and Olivia Knot hosted um, in the, or with the support of the Open Society Foundation. And um, it was kind of like a role play um, where we had a Chinese delegation, a European delegation, the EU member states were present. And um, the results of that simulation were um, five or let's say five key uh, takeaways. Um, first of all, it's not always that easy um, to balance um, economic interests and interest in human, human rights um, and interest in democracy. That is something which is a challenge and where we need to um, well find a, find a good balance. The second takeaway is that it's not always that easy to decide on strategic goals. Uh, what do we really want to achieve in the EU-Chinese relationship? There are differences among the EU member states, um, as I said. The third takeaway is that we really still don't know China that well. Um, and there is um, still very little expertise, um, although we know that some institutions um, have been built up. Um, I mean, one, one of the renowned institutions as we presented today um, in our discussion and um, is, is really a beacon of, of thinking on EU-China relations, but still there is overall limited expertise um, on China um, still present in the EU. The fourth takeaway is that EU-US um, relations will be, at least from the US point of view, be strongly measured um, against what the EU is going to do um, with regard to China. It could become a litmus test um, for the US-EU um, relationship. And last but not least, the fifth takeaway of our simulation was we have elections this year in Germany. France has elections um, uh, next year. And so the French-German motor um, could become a little rusty this and next year. Um, and that could also, well, we have to see what that means to, uh, to the strategic goals um, and strategic policies um, of the European Union um, on digital sovereignty, but also on, um, on, the, on the concept of open strategic um, autonomy. So what we would like to do today is, first of all, we would like to hear from two participants um, of our simulation and put this into context, um, let them tell us what they learned, but also listen to them what they, um, uh, what they can tell us about um, the EU-China um, relationship. Um, and um, that's what we would like to start with. And afterwards, we would then I uh, certainly also like to hear from Niels Annen, uh, Minister of State at the Federal Foreign Office, and then also Svenja Hahn um, from the European side, um, and hear how that really resonates um, in politics, in, rea in, in reality. So um, I would like to start with um, Ale um, Alessia Amigini. Um, she is uh, co-head of Asia Center and uh, Senior Associate Research Fellow at ISPI in Italy. And you are also an Associate Professor of Economics at the Department of Economic and Business Studies at the University of Piemont um, Orientale. And, um, but before we start, it's always nice to know where you currently are. To put it a, a little bit into context, um, are you at, uh, um, in your home office or are you in your office office, Alessia? I'm in, your, in my home office now. In, in your home office in Milan. Yes. And I'm sure that um, spring has already arrived in Milan and that you are enjoying um, a wonderful warm spring day. Also, very chilly these days, very chilly with <laughs> snow and wind and rain, so oh, not very spring. All right. Okay. It's fine. So we, don't have, <laughs> so we don't have to feel too jealous um, of you right now. No, not at all. No. Nowadays, not at all. Wonderful. Very chilly. You were, Thank you. you were one of the participants um, of our um, China simulation. Um, so tell us a little bit about this um, and also tell us how you see the EU-China relationship. Well, I think this is very appropriate because uh, technology has always been at the heart of EU-China relations since back in the 1970s. But now is even more um, the issue uh, in between e Europe and China and in the future it will be the shaping uh, element of our relations with China. And especially when in the context of, you know, um, a kind of a shift from from China 
from cooperation in technology and science to the announcement of you know pursuing a goal of technological independence uh, from say the West. Actually, uh, Europe now finds herself in a very challenging position. And I think that uh, it's very useful to structure the discussion today. Um, I suggest that we should uh, a little bit, um, you know, shape what could be a European position or perception of all the debate, because we are a little bit stuck in the middle of, you know, uh, US, China, EU, US, EU, China. And sometimes I feel uh, that the European perception and position is not very clear, maybe for the internal divergences or um, discrepancies that are you, know, you were mentioning before, but also because we are, I think we are a little bit locked in to different narratives. One is the China's narrative. China has been, you know, um, announcing that she's pursuing indigenous innovation uh, but actually, this is a very, very, um, you know, powerful narrative, but not still the truth in China. China is still very far from being independent on science and technology. She is very brave in announcing, but, you know, she's still looking for technological skills abroad. Last week in Italy, you may have heard of it, Shenzhen Investment uh, Holding tried to acquire LPE near Milan. Uh, a firm making uh, reactors and wafers and a sort of all inputs, technological inputs for a lot of machine, industrial machinery. And uh, Prime Minister Draghi blocked the acquisition on the grounds of, you know, strategic priorities because of the needs from the automotive sector of a lot of, you know, inputs from this firm and a lot of firm clustered with this firm. So. What this tells us is that China is announcing the world she's going to be independent very soon, but she's not. And she's acquiring, trying still to acquire a lot of, you know, very uh, important uh, firms and producers where, where, you know, uh, maybe um, security considerations are perceived to be weaker than elsewhere. And Italy has been perceived to be such a country until last week, I think. So, and also on another very different level, I think the issue of Taiwan, um, of course, China has political objectives on Taiwan. We know we are not going to all go into this today, but there's also a very um, uh, basic economic and strategic motivation behind this political objective on Taiwan, which is the semiconductors and the high-tech uh, skills that China still needs. So uh, these two very different examples of um, which are the facts compared to the narrative. And I think Europe has been uh, captured into this narrative that you know we need to engage with China because China is going to be independent and we're going to miss history if we're not going to engage with China. And on the other hand, Europe has been, you know, also a little bit biased by the US narrative that China is only a systemic rival. We don't need to engage, we don't have to engage. We need to, you know, uh, adopt a kind of a confrontational language that the US has been adopting with Trump, of course, with Biden, much less so, but still the, the foreign chapter on China is very open and very divisive, I would say. So Europe is in the middle and still a European narrative on how to engage with China on proper grounds is to be constructed, I think. And I think this is one of the moments where we can, you know, offer some inputs uh, to build such a position, which is to be a, a collective position, of course. And we, we in Europe, we should, you know, uh, deal with our own divergences and convergences or clubs or niches in Europe by ourselves. I mean, not to disclose too much of our own dialogues within Europe, because nobody's doing this, mm, nor on the other side of the Atlantic, not, nor in the Pacific. But when it comes to Europe, all the European 
say, um, discussions about how we should deal with one or the other are, you know, kind of, you know, open information for everybody, which is not very strategic, I think. So, um, I, I mean, I, I try to be very frank to give, you know, a lot of inputs for the discussion. So, I think that being trapped into the two, you know, opposing narratives, the Chinese narrative, uh, very brave, uh, very pushy, and the US narrative, uh, totally different, prevents Europe and has prevented Europe, uh, us so far, to try to, you know, um, focus more on which is our own narrative, I mean, which is our own position. And I think that we are much more powerful than the, the two other parts would, you know, pretend us to be. Um, so this is my input for now on how we should, you know, shape the discussion uh, more, say, on an active mode than passive mode. Great, thank you so much. Um, just a follow up question, um, Alessia. In our simulation, um, our EU China um, summit simulation, you actually represented China. So, were, were you pushy in your approach? Um, how was it uh, being actually representing China in such an exercise? Well, uh, China is uh, a much easier position than the US and Europe, in fact, because she enjoys a lot of preferential conditions. And in the WTO and in other fora, she has a lot of room for maneuver to try to shape her own policies, uh, which Europe and the US don't have. And this is a very you know, what we, with a very, you know, um, uh, not very easy uh, terminology, the level playing field, which I don't like, but in fact is uh, one of the issues uh, on the table. And, but the level, the, the field is not level. And, you know, to try to level it up uh, is actually very dangerous, also in, term, in terms of terminology, because China is a, a developing country and she all always you know um you know pretends she doesn't have to level the play the the field because she's a developing country so this is a very dangerous avenue for discussion so not to talk about reciprocity or level playing field because otherwise we are going to you know to play the chinese game and this is was the lesson i learned when playing the chinese part in that exercise. I think it's very easy for China to, 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 to enter into these discussions because at the end of the day, she always has the option to say, I'm a developing country. And then we're stuck, you know, in a corner. Hmm. But if we try not to go into that discussion and terminology, then we avoid being in the corner. Thank you. Thank you so much. And China has also the uh, possibility to just say, no, I guess um, I should have said that in the beginning when I talked about the takeaways of our summit, we were not able to find an agreement. We ended our exercise very realistically without a joint summit um, statement. Um, so let, let me now turn to John Lee, um, who is Senior Researcher and Coordinator at the Research Cluster China's Use of Digital Technologies at the Mercator Institute for China Studies, MERICS. Um, and I would say you are one of the leading voices um, on EU-China um, affairs um, here in Berlin and Germany. And in our exercise, um, you were the head of the French delegation and you also simulated some of the inter European inter-EU meetings. Um, and as I was told, that was also not an easy position and not an easy avenue. And um, please, John, could you tell us a little bit about um, your perception on inter-EU uh, positions um, on EU-China relations? 
Well, thank you very much, Dr. Nildner. And um, first, let me say that it's a privilege to be here today speaking in such august company. Um, I might prefer this by saying that I am a transplant from Australia, as you might be able to pick up from the accent. So it was certainly an interesting experience playing the French delegation in a simulation exercise that involved an EU-China negotiation and very educative for me personally. On the exercise itself, I found, um, for me at least, um, the most insightful experience was how difficult it was to reach consensus on basic points among the different European delegations, to the point where we were actually unable to, grasp, to grapple with the specific issues that had been put on the agenda. Um, very quickly, we discovered that the discussion became bogged down on headline issues of principle. Um, and I think this reflects, as Professor Armagini has already referred to, the lack of clarity at least at a granular level on Europe's strategic priorities as a whole via v China. And if uh, one were to look at the summary document on the Aspen website regarding the simulation's outcomes, um, it does explain in some detail the different priorities um, that different European delegations put forth and how these to some extent hobbled the ability of the European side to come up with a consistent position. Of course, um, as Dr. Mildner has referred to, uh, this was short-circuited in any case by the refusal of the Chinese side to proceed with a communique given uh, the event that was thrown into the mix concerning Taiwan. And to me, that also um, is very resonant with recent events, certainly, and obviously my own um, institution has been affected by this to an extent um, concerning the current um, sanctions between China and the European Union and the way in which that has impacted upon the larger program of establishing an equilibrium between the two parties. Um, if I might turn my comments to some headline issues, um, I will try and organize these along five points, which I'm happy to expand on um, in the moderated discussion later, and of course in the question and answer session. But of course, um, I do work for an organization that focuses on China. So let me begin with some observations on how things look from the Chinese viewpoint. Now, Professor Amagini has already referred to the perception from the Chinese side that they, at the end of the day, still need connections with the outside world and with the advanced economies especially. And she referred, of course, um, to the recently blocked attempted acquisition of an Italian company in the semiconductor supply chain, an issue that I happen to be working on myself at the moment, um, indeed with the generous support of the Federal Foreign Office. Um, this has brought home to me, and this is of course um, reflected in a range of other sectors, how dependent China still is on these foreign connections. And I think, um, again, with reference to Professor Armagini's comments about the need to understand Europe's advantages, it's important to remain focused on the things that Europe still has to offer to China. And this goes, of course, for uh, like-minded partners in the United States and elsewhere. And this is reflected very clearly on the Chinese side in statements um, by President Xi Jinping um, in various levels of Chinese declared policy that the country needs to maintain an open environment and connections with the outside world. The challenge, of course, from a foreign viewpoint um, comes from the greater emphasis that is increasingly being placed on the need to balance that from the Chinese viewpoint with greater control. Um, and this doubtless presents some great challenges at both the regulatory level in terms of access, for example, to different sectors of the Chinese economy. And there, um, again, perhaps later on, we can talk in more detail to what uh, has been set out in the CAI, but also the existing situation with the Chinese economy and high tech sectors. But indeed, also at the political level, where once more the situation with respect to Xinjiang and the sanctions over the last month, I think, has illustrated very clearly how um, political obstacles um, can, uh, in a way that wasn't so obvious um, a decade or even several years ago, um, impose themselves uh, in terms of the Chinese side's political priorities um, on the ability to reach common ground. I might also observe um, from the transatlantic perspective, um, which perhaps we can again cover more um, later in this event, that finding a common position will be important to dealing with many of the key technical issues which were raised, for example, in the outline document for this event. If we are talking about uh, international data transfers, just to use one example, of course, there is no international regime, at least not at a detailed level within the WTO framework or otherwise, which currently governs this area. 
And indeed, we are seeing significant divergence, both on the judicial side and the policy side, um, between the European Union and the United States um, in terms of the priorities governing regulation of data management and international exchange. And until those issues can be reconciled in a transatlantic context, it is very difficult to talk about a common position via v China. Now, that, of course, doesn't mean that um, Europe does not have a clear position regarding data governance. I believe um, that already with the GDPR and with the TREMS 2 decision and its aftermath, and of course, the Commission's legislative proposals, it is very clear what... Um, priorities are at least at a European level. And of course, um, this is supported um, by projects such as Gaia-X and the priorities um, which have been articulated by various European member states. Um, but whether a joint transatlantic position can be reached with respect to China, um, I think is still very much an open question and how this proceeds with the new Biden administration um, and its willingness to make compromises where from the American side, the Trump administration, for example, was not um, will have a significant impact. Um, just minding the time, um, I might in fact restrict my um, closing remarks and happy to um, touch on some of the other themes a bit further on to uh, an observation about um, the general trend regarding digital technology. Um, as Dr. Milton mentioned, my portfolio is concerned with digital technology in the round. And of course, we are entering a world now where increasingly everything will be digitized. Um, the most obvious example of this is the so-called Internet of Things and the increasing connection of everything. In fact, this is how it is phrased in the Chinese policy documents, the connection of everything and the amplified risks and opportunities that come with that. When the Internet is embedded throughout the physical world, then it creates an entirely new set of issues, or at least on a new scale, which policymakers have not had to grapple before. And the interconnection of the world, which we have come to take for granted through globalization and through the propagation of the internet and connected digital technologies over the past few decades um, will raise an entirely in kind, at least, um, or in uh, magnitude set of issues, which um, will need grappling with not only within the transatlantic context via China, but indeed on a global scale. So I think that's enough from me for the time being, and I'll um, turn back to Dr. Mildner, perhaps for some more focused questions and comments. Great, thank you so much. Um, both of you now mentioned um, divergent narratives um, and pointing at um, maybe that we are overestimating um, that China um, is independent. Maybe we need to talk about how much China still needs us which might also give us a different negotiation position. Now, when we did our EU-China summit, we played, right? It was a role play. Um, for you, State Secretary, that is not a play. <laughs> you are negotiating um, or have been negotiating with China, for example, under the German EU Council presidency, um, the uh, China-EU investment agreement. And I have to say that wasn't play. That was hard work. So, <laughs> so how does the reality of EU-China relations look like? And how does the reality of German-China relations look like? Well, um, first of all, thanks for having me. And um, thanks for the uh, indeed very interesting inputs. And, and I agree. I mean, of course, it's not a play. Although negotiations always have uh, something of that dynamic. And I, I think that's also true when we come to um, the evaluation of our relationship with China. Because to be very frank with you, what we saw also in that negotiation about the investment agreement is that China is not immune to political pressure. And a lot has been said, and there is an ongoing discussion whether or not it was the right timing for Europe to have that negotiation concluded. But we certainly saw that there was a reaction uh, in Beijing towards um, American pressure and that somehow um, the Chinese had to react. And, and so I, I don't believe that this is a, um, it's a secret um, that this had an impact in general. And I may also refer to some what my, uh, my colleagues already said. I, I believe the, the European line has significantly changed. Uh, and not because we changed our point of view towards China, but basically because Chinese politics changed. 
Um, so we have uh, uh, real uh, experts here on the call and uh, I I'm happy to let them correct me, but I think it's fair to say that um, with President Xi Jinping assuming that immense amount of power also in comparison to his predecessors and at least partially abolishing uh, the collective leadership that has always been an essential part of Chinese policies uh, and, and, and somehow also ended the, um, the, the strategic orientation that China has been following for so many years that came from Deng Xiaoping's um, well, uh, 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 slogan to, to keep a low profile, to, to never take the lead, to be pragmatic in conflicts. Uh, I, I think Europe and the West in general had to react to what has been an increasingly uh, aggressive, sometimes aggressive and authoritarian uh, line and, and less willingness to compromise. Um, be it in regional conflicts, um, but also in trade conflicts. So that is one of the reasons why, why the European Union and Germany as well is talking about um, a strategic rivalry. And, and that's not just, you know, a bullet point and an official document. That's part of our reality today. Uh, but what I am concerned about is that this is not the whole picture. We still are convinced that China uh, is and must be a partner. It's also, as we all know, a competitor, but, but we shouldn't completely, you know, let the two other aspects of our strategic outlook overshadow the fact that we have a vital interest in keeping um, a good relationship, both politically and economic relationship with China. And that's why I found it very interesting to hear about um, our two speakers, previous speakers, talking about the narrative. And, uh, and, and the narrative has been increasingly that of only looking at a strategic rival. Um, and especially, but not exclusively, during the Trump years, uh, you know, we observed a language that somehow, sometimes at least, uh, sounds very familiar to what we all uh, have been learning during the Cold War. And the discussion that I believe the Europeans need to have among the European Union, but also with our American uh, allies and friends, is what is our policy? Do we really want to contribute to a new kind of bipolarization or a new uh, polarization? Um, you know, it's not entirely up to us whether we will be able to avoid that or not. Um, but we should be very careful um, and not only talking about China, but also talking about many other issues. I think the last four difficult years uh, between the European Union and the Trump administration told us the lesson that we really need to work towards a more sovereign European Union when it comes to our instruments, political instruments, trade instruments, etc. So we need to have our own um, position on China uh, and now we have a new opportunity with the Biden administration that is open to consultations uh, but I doubt knowing a little bit about the US debate about China but could also be a applicable to the US debate about Russia that um, that we will be completely in line with what our American friends are doing so that's why we, we need to have our own instruments. And Germany, uh, in all modesty, plays a crucial role. I'm completely aware that not everybody was always happy about uh, Berlin's China policy, also within the European Union. Why is that? Maybe also because we established quite an exclusive um, instrument with government consultations on an annual basis, uh, uh, usually Sometimes even more than half of our cabinets are involved. As the Chancellor is regularly um, uh, visiting China, we have high-level visits here. So Germany has always been able to make face time with Chinese leaders. And we know that this is not always the case for smaller member states. So that's why the idea of having a EU-China summit and 
Stormy, not um, only, if I may say so, although it was very useful to have that a simulation, simula a simulation but a real China EU summit um, had also the purpose um, to demonstrate to our friends in the European Union that, that Germany really is prepared to make an own contribution um, towards more co cohesion within the European Union when it comes to China, but also to continue what has been a crucial line of communication with Beijing. So now COVID came into, uh, <laughs> came into play and we all know how that ended. But I think that kind of communication remains crucial. And we all know that although we are concerned about also developments in terms of uh, increased military spending, not only in China, but in the region in general, and the, we, the need for a new round in, in arms uh, uh, reduction and arms control talks, but the real instrument of, of strategic rivalry, if I may use that uh, term again, today is trade policy. Uh, and these are really the instruments that has been applied. And uh, although um, when we maybe later touch also on issues like 5G, where I have a, certainly a more hawkish view on, on that, and uh, I don't trust that Chinese technology to be open with you, but I do believe that the trend that we are observing towards uh, a technological decoupling is not serving our interest. Um, especially um, as a very open economy that uh, the European economies, Germany have, has always been. Uh, and, and we need to have an honest conversation about what are the right instruments. On the other hand, there is no alternative to a stronger cooperation in defending our interests um, uh, uh, towards um, uh, increasingly assertive China. And the issues have been named, the situation in Xinjiang and Hong Kong and others um, so there's a lot, uh, Stomi, I believe, uh, to discuss today, and I'm very happy to be um, part of that panel and uh, to share uh, my views with you. Thank you so much, um, State Secretary um, Nides, if I may. I do have a follow-up question to you, because there's sure. a lot of discussion on um, a sovereign European Union or an autonomous European Union. Um, wh what do you mean personally when you say that the EU needs to be more sovereign? Well, look, I, I, believe, um, I believe in the value of transatlantic relationships. And I certainly hope, and, and we made a real effort to, 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 to add that, uh, to come into, you know, in a close strategic consultation mode with the Trump administration, also about China, without much of concrete <laughs> results. Um, so so I, I believe that basically we share uh, in a broader way uh, same interests and views on, on issues like human rights, and democracy, transparency. Um, but we, we need to be honest with each other. Um, so uh, the, the, the American, uh, especially over the last four years, have applied sanctions against uh, German and European companies uh, when we had political differences, uh, extraterritorial sanctions. Mm. Uh, they um, also, when it comes to China, increasingly are expecting that, you know, um, their allies are, are following their narrative. And so, you know, nothing of, of the points that I mentioned are speaking against the closer cooperation with the United States, but without creating instruments to protect our own companies also from the threat of sanctions from France. I'm very sorry that I need to address it in that clear way, but that's what we are talking about uh, with reference, for example, to, uh, to the Iran business, uh, to dealing with Cuba, or of course, the most controversial issue, which is Nord Stream 2. And, um, and, and so that's why Europe needs to define its own interests. And that's the best base to deal in a transatlantic way, but also the best and most, most transparent way uh, to make our priorities clear um, towards our Chinese friends. 
Thank you so much. Um, we already get we are already getting the first questions from our audience. Um, just as a reminder um, to all of those who are listening in, um, please write um, your questions in the Q and A function. Um, we cannot call on you um, and have you directly in the discussion, but I'm very um, happy to integrate your questions into the discussion already now, but also later on in the Q&A. So don't be shy, send us your questions. So um, let's now come to uh, Svenja Hahn. Um, you are a member of the European Parliament. You're an expert on trade issues. Um, you're an expert on digital issues and certainly an export expert on the EU-US relationship. And um, if I remember correctly, um, the EU-China um, investment agreement was not met by with applause um, in the parliament. <laughs> um, quite the contrary, there was a lot of criticism. Um, and maybe you, you can tell us a little bit about that criticism, um, the most critical points, um, why the parliament wasn't happy with it, and what you would believe needs to happen for the parliament to actually sign on to the agreement. Well, thank you very much. Uh, excellent question, Storin. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it was very interesting to listen um, uh, to Niels, of course, but also to the other speakers about the, the simulation. There were actually some very, very interesting um, aspects and uh, someone that is working on a daily basis, both in trade relations, but also in tech relations. It was really, uh, I was really keen on, on hearing about that. And um, if we're talking especially about trade relations, why do we have so much expectations and trade in the EU? Uh, it is because we're not having a very much working foreign policy. I mean, we've just had two big humiliations of the EU on foreign policy level just in the past, just last week with Sofagate and Turkey. Uh, with Borel and Russia, uh, and we can't really much agree on many aspects in foreign policy. But what is an original task of the EU is uh, is trade. Uh, we are maybe not the most diplomatic power at the moment, but we for sure are an economic power. And uh, therefore, a lot of relations we have are defined on, on the economy level. And uh, looking at China, we've seen in the lot only um, in the past, there was only the focus on the economic partner that China is. Uh, and I mean, that is a, is a sheer fact. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, by now, almost everybody realized that the nature of the Chinese system is as well that of a systemic rival. And uh, that is threatening our democratic values, that is threatening our fundamental rights. And of course, is uh, in itself striving for more regional and geopolitical dominance worldwide also, while breaching for economic competition. And um, that as well, the German industry realized that is becoming more and more critical of it. And uh, in the meantime, more and more EU member states have realized that. And uh, I think it was a mistake that we so silently for such a long time watched a huge authoritarian player become more and more dominant in the world and uh, violating many things that we believe in, fundamental human rights, too fair competition. Uh, so we really have to, to decide ourselves, where are we in this path of history and what way do we want to take? Um, so we have a very cr critical situation at the moment. Um, I absolutely think the Kai was a mistake. I've been very critical about it before. I think it was a strategic mistake time-wise to rush it in the last days uh, of the German presidency instead of developing a joint approach together with the new US, uh, US administration. Um, so, so that's a mistake uh, from, from the timing as well. And if we look at the content, I believe it's simply not good enough because it's not addressing the really pressing um, problems we have. I do think it would help to, to have an agreement. We need to address China's um, behavior on many levels, the unfair trade practices, for example. Um, but is not addressing all those problems, especially not the, the investment protection uh, issues that are there. It's left in the loop hanging for a further agreement um, regarding the market openness. Uh, it's simply not good enough. So the content is, yeah, not as what it would be needed. And uh, if we look at the human rights issue, they're simply not addressed. 
uh, not addressed enough. So uh, before the, the latest sanctions, uh, we have said in the European Parliament, in order to be able to even ratify it, um, the Parliament would expect China to ratify the international labor uh, law um, articles that are addressed uh, in the CHI, ratify and have a concrete timetable. Um, that was what we said before. Um, but finally, the EU sanctioned China, in my opinion, a bit more symbolic. Uh, China's, uh, the US, uh, the EU cha sanctioned four Chinese individuals and one company that are taking part in the um, human rights, uh, massive human rights violation in Xinjiang, uh, which uh, some parliaments uh, like the um, Dutch parliament or the Canadian parliament already decided amount uh, in their um, sincerity to a genocide. Um, the EU finally agreed on sanctions and uh, China reacted with counter sanctions, um, attacking democracy and freedom of speech and uh, even sanctions um, MEPs and sanctioned the whole Committee for Human Rights uh, of the European Parliament. And um, I thought it was a hard content advice before, but actually in my group, the Liberal Group Renew Europe, we believe that um, ratification process should not even be on the agenda of the Parliament as long as China is sanctioning and targeting the work of parliamentarians. So um, I've been very critical content voice, but now it's really become um, an instrument as well and a matter of where we're standing on China's uh, aspects of, of human rights. Uh, so it's very closely tied uh, tied to that aspect and uh, coming a bit to, to the tech aspect as well. Um, we, we face the same decisions. I'm, I'm serving as well in the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence. And um, yeah, regarding EU-China tech relations, it's about technology and its governance. And where the decisions we're going to take in the coming years will as well define our roles on technology uh, in the world. Niels Annen already mentioned it, for example, the 5G rollout and potential participation of, uh, of China, um, but also sharing of data, um, what is about a set of framework for artificial intelligence. I think this is an example where we clearly see the biggest difference. Uh, China is known for its a crazy, crazy amount of um, supervision, of monitoring uh, of its, its population. And this is something clearly where democratic countries should set clear boundaries. Um, this is where, where the US and the EU uh, should definitely work together. But as well, we see in the US, so we remember about the Clearwater um, scandal where uh, law enforcement uh, used uh, facial recognition as well. So there are as well challenges uh, in, in defining this aspect in a relation uh, with the US. So to yeah, generally speak, um, if we want to boost our digital economy, which I think is a focus uh, in not only in the Commission agenda, but also on our way out of the, the economic corona crisis, uh, we need to set as well a framework of, um, yeah, a, a legal framework in which we want to uh, operate and then which we maybe don't want to operate um, when it comes to relations um, with China, but also these aren't easy aspects uh, with the US. Thank you so much. It's, it's always good to have a panel um, where the panelists don't agree on everything. So we have a little bit of a controversy here. Um, and also a follow up question um, to you, Svenja. Um, you mentioned that you were critical of the timing also, also of the content, but also of the timing. Um, so the agreement isn't signed yet. Um, and um, we heard from Niels um, that China is reacting um, to political pressure. Could the um, opposition of the European Parliament, could that be not used um, by negotiators to negotiate a better um, CAI CHI deal? So could we not say that it was strategically actually pretty clever um, to find an agreement um, on the basics and then use the European Parliament as a pressure point to get something even better? Um, I honestly believe, if I may be so frank, the European, um, the the German presidency wanted to have a a, a win 
uh, in their presidency. It's highly uncommon to have such uh, high amounting um, trade agreements or investment agreements conducted on the Christmas holiday. So this is very, very unusual. Um, so that was where a lot of criticism is uh, coming from, from, from the European Parliament as well. But nevertheless, I'm, I'm one of those that think we would need a good agreement actually to address unfair trade practices from China, but the content is simply not good enough. Um, I'm having some questions if the Chinese actually understand the role of the European Parliament, um, because with their sanctions, um, where we are sanctioning um, because of the horrible uh, breaches of human rights, they are sanctioning uh, elected members of parliament and a whole committee for doing their job. Um, so I have some question mark if the, if the Chinese actually understand that it needs the European Parliament to actually approve any agreement in the end, or if actually China doesn't care so much about the, the Kai investment agreement, or if they believe the EU is so weak that it will just give in um, because it will not be united enough. So that is the questions I have regarding China, mm -hmm. and it shows for me that the EU really needs to stand together and stand firm against China, because China is only understanding a question of strength and strength means clarity and standing by your decisions and clearly drawing red lines and uh, we're going to be stronger in enforcing our red lines if we draw them together with the US and of that I'm very certain. Thank you so much. Um, back to you Niels because there was such an important uh, project under the EU Council Presidency um, and I'm sure you thought a lot about this, um, about the timing and, and the content. Um, so I would like to give the floor again to you to explain um, the German position to us a little bit more in depth. Well look, um, I, I, I certainly um, hear the argument, um, I respect the argument that has been made uh, from critics not only within the European Parliament uh, but also the broader public that we should have been waiting for the US administration. Um, and, and we heard even some of those expectation uh, by the then um, still incoming Biden administration. Um, you know this is, um, this is a, a public debate but if I may be so frank uh, just think for a moment, a US administration would have waited to conclude an investment package or, or, or deal with China or any other major country in the world to wait for, let's say, hypothetical, a new um, EU commission assume uh, 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 their new role. That would have never have had, that never would have happened. So, you know, um, we know it's a long process and I think everything uh, uh, that, that um, Svenja said um, is relevant and will be part of the discussion and at the end of the day it's the European Parliament uh, to take that decision. Um, so I, I was not in the room when that was negoti negotiated, uh, but we have to say that there were extraordinary Chinese movement. Um, so the reason for that last minute conclusion was not uh, that the Chancellor wanted to have another win or I mean she, she does not need to add to her international prestige. And I say that as a social democrat, I think that's pretty well established to be honest. That was because there was movement and we had the impression that it's in, in Europe's best interest uh, to react on that. And you know I'm listening to all that rhetoric about stronger, more cohesive European policy and European sovereignty or even autonomy. But then if the moment is there, everybody is afraid to just do that. What you know, our Americans friends American friends would not have wasted a second in even debating that. So if we want to become a little more sovereign, let's act a little more sovereign. And um, we actually have our, one of our first questions is on sovereignty. Um, so Ned Wiley asked if European, if sovereignty is actually a realistic policy goal at all for the European Union, being kind of in the squeeze between um, 
you could say not even a triangle, but a quadrangle, so to say, with Russia on one hand and China on the other hand, and then the United States um, is and I would like to start again with you, Niels. Is the EU actually strong enough to be sovereign? And then I also would like to ask Svenja about this before I um, then come back to Alessia and John to ask you more about the digital issues. Um, so, Niels, are we strong enough to be sovereign? <laughs> I, I would say it depends, right? Because what Svenja uh, said um, about the lack of unity in terms of foreign policy, that's certainly true. And, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an optimistic uh, person and I believe that we can overcome some of that obstacles. But we do have the divisions that um, we saw in the United States when it comes to questions of, of you know, um, uh, <clears throat> of transparency, of media freedom, of authoritarian behavior. Uh, we have all those prob all that problem all those problems within the European Union, unfortunately, and it's part of what is uh, shaping the debate right now. Um, and and of course, uh, when it comes to China, but also when it comes to other policies, we made it quite easy to um, to outside actors. I would remain it in an abstract way with your permission, Stormy. We made it quite easy for outside actors, you know, to block certain political decisions uh, because some countries believe they have a short term uh, gain if, if they block um, a EU position. But we shouldn't forget that indeed we are a global power when it comes to trade. And when it comes uh, to those kind of negotiations, the European Union is well prepared. I think not sufficiently. We need to do more to protect our companies. We need to think about the um, political weaponization of the US dollar, as we saw, especially over the last four years. But the threat is not off the table, as we know, when it, for example, comes to Nord Stream 2, but also other aspects. So that's where we need to work on. But when I talk about European sovereignty, that's not, you know, in the spirit of confrontation with the United States or the country. We have a unique opportunity that we, we cannot afford to waste, to realign ourselves in many important policy issues with the United States. But to realign does not mean that we are adopting their position. You know, it, it means that we share most of the same broad ideas about how our world should be organized. Um, but we don't know what's going to happen in four years. We don't know if Mr. Trump is going to come back or one of his kids or somebody who's going to continue his policies. So that's why we need to become more sovereign, but it's not going to be a process that is going to be concluded in one or even four years. I believe it's a process and in the meantime, we need to apply wise policies in terms of foreign policy, in terms of trade, uh, and uh, we need to try in our own interest to avoid a global confrontation. That is true for China, that is true for other countries that are important to us. Svenja, what has to happen for the EU to be str strong? <laughs> well, I think first and foremost, we should not fall into the protectionist trap um, because I hear a lot of um, um, people from all kinds of spectrums of the political agenda um, mistaken um, yeah, in independence or strategic open autonomy for uh, yeah, being protectionist and going an isolist way. I think we should not fall that. For me, this means, uh, well, growing up realizing that we are a relevant player on the world stage and that we are a relevant player especially in economic terms but uh, that we should as well and grow more into the role of being a diplomatic player as well and uh, i mean it's uh, it's we we can not and never be completely sustainable and that is not the way in a, in a globalized world it lies in cooperation uh, i think the eu will uh, be 
stronger on a world stage if we manage to speak more with with one voice that also of course includes for me um internal reforms we're starting a process with the conference for the future of europe um where it's going to be a broad dialogue of task as well um but there's already a lot that can be do now uh, strengthening the the position of, for example of um uh, of the commission, but also having the council agreeing more and um, pushing forward more together on a joint stage, um, that already would strengthen the role of the of the EU very much. But also, what is needed is that we are re a reliable partner. And uh, there, I would like to come back to trade. Um, for example, we have the trade agreement with uh, Canada. The CETA is fully not yet fully ratified. Uh, in all member states as provisional applied. Um, we have the agreed um, trade agreement with the Mercosur countries, which has not been ratified yet. Um, so for, for the reliability, it's also a matter if we stick to agreements, if we um, bring this to life, and also if we show that we are, uh, that we have our red lines, and if they are not, uh, if they're crossed over, um, that we act. Um, a smaller example, for example, is um, the partial um, withdrawal of, of um, trade preferences uh, in uh, Cambodia, for example, uh, because the rules are not met there. So it's also uh, about not being all talks, but also actions. And as it's not all about talk, but really actions, um, Ulrike Franke asked about uh, artificial intelligence and the role of the European Parliament and uh, the role of the um, AIDA Committee on Artificial Intelligence. And the question also goes to you, um, Svenja. Um, what role does the European Parliament play or can play in the debate on artificial intelligence? It's actually one of the most hot topics in the last year in the European Parliament. Um, we have, uh, I think, um, I have worked on more than eight um, positions from the Parliament uh, and the Single Market Committee. There are a committee for the Special Committee for Artificial Intelligence is uh, is not a legislative committee. It's streamlining the position of the Parliament on many aspects, but the legislative work is happening in uh, in the permanent committees. Um, massively so far in the in the committee for the single market, which I'm also a member of. Um, frankly, what is planned, uh, the European Commission is coming with a proposal for horizontal AI regulation next week, actually. Um, and um, there, the whole legislation and the parliament is working on its position right now. We're actually this week I think on Wednesday, um, we're going to approve the Parliament's position on this uh, in the Committee for the Single Market. And basically, the idea is setting a legislative framework, a bit of a pioneer work having legislation on artificial intelligence. And the idea behind this is setting worldwide standards. I addressed it very quickly in my opening statement. It's a matter of who is going to set the framework of the usage that we want to see of artificial intelligence. Um, which is, for example, protection of fundamental values of consumer rights, but also data protection, um, prevention of censorship, and no use for, for uh, mass surveillance, uh, no use of AI for mass surveillance or social scoring, for example. And at the same time, of course, the EU needs to stay uh, or even be better innovation friendly and uh, prevent unnecessary burdens. The whole idea is to create a digital single market for AI, because the single market would was made the EU economically so strong. And we need to make it easier to invent new business models and to scale that them up much easier in a safe regulatory framework. Thank you so much. Um, I would now like to dig a little bit deeper into the tech issues. And for this, um, John, we need your help. Could you explain to us what the most pertinent tech issues are in the um, EU-China relationship, which we really have to deal with um, ASAP? Well, I must say that sounds like mission impossible, but I assume that you're giving me about five or six minutes, so I'll have my first shot. Or maximum. Um, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I flagged in my comments before that for me, the rise of the Internet of Things is in some ways the unifying 
framework here. Because, of course, if we talk about technologies like 5G, it's usually in the context not of faster video downloads on your mobile phone, but of the future industrial applications, the self-driving car ecosystems and so on, um, which, of course, are fundamentally part of the Internet of Things. And the key concept here is that more and more real-world functions and aspects of society will be organized and governed through the Internet and through digital technologies. So I personally think that this is a topic which, in fact, merits more attention um, from my observation um, in the European policy discourse and is a unifying thread for the various discussions around next generation telecommunications networks, around artificial intelligence, around um, the various um, enabling technologies such as semiconductors, which have already come up. Um, here, I think it's worthwhile also widening the lens a bit. And um, <clears throat> I note that from Mr. Moss has made some comments this week. Um, obviously, this is a now well-established trend in Europe towards a greater focus on the Indo-Pacific region. And partly this is, of course, because of China's increasingly assertive diplomatic footprint around the world. But I think that it does reflect, and again, I speak from a perspective as a former Australian Foreign Service officer here, um, of the rising importance of other countries besides China in the, deciding these questions about digital technology on a global scale. Now, if we come back to the issue of an integrated Internet of Things around the world, I think that this is really where the litmus test will be for the ability of the European Union and its project to set standards and um, to ensure that um, the governance frameworks are informed by European values, whether or not those have been agreed at some level um, in the transatlantic space um, with the larger world. Because, of course, if we look forward, and to some extent the pandemic has clouded this picture, but as a general principle, the economic growth and the increase in the online population who will use these digital technologies on a global scale in the future is not coming from Europe and it's not coming from North America. It is coming from Africa, from South Asia, from Southeast Asia, the regions which again Von Mr. Maas has highlighted this week in terms of a priority for a European Indo-Pacific approach. And the attitudes that these countries will have towards restricting Chinese technology and to participating in standardization, and the metrics show that they are playing an increasing role quite fast in the development of the underlying technologies, at least at some levels, um, is going to have to inform European policy. Um, just to put a fine point on this, um, if we were to use the concrete example of the Commission's digital roadmap, for instance, which of course was only uh, published last month, um, and some of the associated initiatives like the Digital for Development project um, with respect to capacity building um, and setting of governance and technical standards overseas, um, much emphasis is placed on growing European digital connections with Africa. Um, and indeed, the African Union, I believe, is nominated as the initial regional partner for the D4D initiative um, for building a connected international cyberspace, which is safe for European values. Um, Africa is a continent where 70 percent, it's estimated, of the existing wireless broadband infrastructure is equipped by Huawei. Its fastest growing economy and its second largest economy, that is Kenya and South Africa respectively, have both just signed contracts with Huawei, in fact, in partnership with Nokia, I believe, in Kenya's case, um, to equip their fifth generation telecommunications networks. Um, and at least um, so far as we can tell, there's not been a single telecoms contract which has been cancelled with Huawei by any African government as a consequence of all of the political pressure that has been exerted by the United States over the past few years under the Trump administration, nor apparently of any initiatives emanating from the European Union to date. And this is just to illustrate the challenges that will be presented to Europe if it wants to remain part of an integrated global technology ecosystem based on the internet and digital technologies. So I think this is the context in which discussions around setting artificial intelligence standards and the values that should underpin them, internet governance and so on, need to take place. Um, and there will be some hard choices presented. I mean, the term decoupling has already been used today. Um, obviously, that is a potential choice, albeit one which will be a lot harder to execute in practice and a lot more costly, I think, than many people yet realize. Um, but 
Um, if that choice is made, I think that there needs to be a very clear understanding that large parts of the world may not choose U.S. leadership or indeed transatlantic leadership, never mind the leadership of Brussels and the European Union. And that is some um, context that needs to be brought to the decisions that are made and the compromises that potentially will be made when it comes to policy and regulation on these issues. Because again, if we look at countries like Indonesia, like Brazil, like even India, which is often cited in the context of cooperation via v Beijing these days, their priorities as demonstrated by their actions, including with respect to China in particular, are very different from those of the European capitals and indeed of Washington, D.C. But um, again, perhaps let me wrap up there and uh, allow Professor Amagini to provide her perspective on these issues. Oh, absolutely. Um, and um, Alessia, um, when, when you provide us with your take um, on the issue, could you also, um, we have one question coming in, um, again, on the transatlantic relationship, um, asking, um, if we need to first solve our transatlantic uh, conflicts on platform regulation, digital taxes, and some uh, da data protection before we can actually um, cooperate um, transatlantically and work or join our forces um, with regard to China. And uh, we would be very interested in your take on that issue as well. Well, this is a very big issue, uh, yeah. but you know, let me follow up a little bit on what uh, Neil Sosvania and John has, have said just a minute. Um, don't you feel that everyone is calling Europe for, for something that according to either the US or China, we shouldn't be doing? I mean, this is very, I mean, annoying, uh, irritating. I mean, uh, Europe, I think, I'm very open to US, China engagement, everybody else's, and Europe has demonstrated that uh, she's a global power, not just on trade, because trade has been a vehicle to channel all the non so-called non-trade issues that Europe has been including in the new generation agreements, comprehensive agreements with uh, Vietnam, Japan as well, very different countries, and they are going very well. So uh, Europe is also a global power on values. We have been building values within our own borders. We have been sharing values. We have been offering values to in the in the realm of cooperation with third countries, developing and developed countries. We have been very quietly negotiating with very different countries and we are going on. So we are a global power on values and everybody is calling us because we should be doing this, we shouldn't be doing that. I mean, uh, uh, again, maybe this is a terminology, but we are, you know, being, you know, on a passive mode, I think. And what uh, John was mentioning now is that Europe has the power um, I mean, uh, it, politically and also uh, technically to be a trend sector also in sharing values and as the digital, the future of manufacturing will depend on digital technologies. The, 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 the values framing how digital technology will be regulated will be shaping all the uh, relations with the US and with China and with the rest of the world. So uh, when it comes to values, the, the, the most crucial value that has been putting us in this very uncomfortable position in between the US and China is that we have been pursuing competition within our own borders while nobody else is doing at home. The US is not doing, China is not doing, and they are scolding us and we, are, we keep doing this. So we should be offering the benefits of competition, even if competition has prevented us from, 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 from developing our own 5G. Remember when Nokia and Ericsson were uh, kept apart by Commissioner, uh, I don't remember her name, pardon me, but this is a very crucial issue of values 
uh, within Europe that we have been designing, we stick to them despite what's happening in the other big powers. So we are a major power also in values. Uh, of course, this is you know, jeopardizing a little bit the internal market as well, because we are welcoming big uh, power, uh, big um, powers at firms, uh, and we are preventing national or European champions. And this is at the very heart of digital development now. But in terms of values, so which values are regulating the digital uh, technologies, we should be, you know, uh, acting as a major power. And so I follow up on what John was saying. Of course, Africa is, you know, navigating in Chinese mm, waters, we, we have to say, but still there's a room to, you know, try to offer cooperation, I mean, real cooperation, not something which is pretending to be cooperation, but it's actually business as usual. Uh, and But we must be very, very assertive. And, you know, in African terms, they welcome very different visions of Africa, which is not what Europe has been thinking and acting on Africa in terms of cooperative behavior. And this puts us in a very weak position. You know, when sticking to values, one is very weak. But when acting on values, we should gain our strength, which is there, but, you know, it's, you know, under the carpet because the big powers, US and China, don't stick to our own values. And they stick to the monopolies, and not let me mention, you know, firms on the one side, on the other side. There are very many on the one side, on the other side. There are none in Europe. How come? I would start from this point, very point. And I would like the European Parliament to be very conscious of this. I don't think we are conscious of this. We, we keep being scolded for what we are doing. And this is very annoying. I mean, everybody from the US part and from the Chinese part is being, you know, uh, 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 they are reacting, overreacting for interference. This never happens in Europe. We, we you know, you know my point. I think I would rephrase the argument by setting the global power on values, which nobody wants to acknowledge us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for making this a uh, very assertive point. Um, unfortunately, time is already running short in, in our discussion. Um, so I do have to bundle questions quite a bit. Um, and I hope that we can cover, um, still cover the content sufficiently. Um, but I have to ask for the understanding of our audience that I can't uh, read out every single question, but I do have to bundle it a little bit. I want to ask if, um, pick up one of the questions um, of um, Wiebke and Leander, and they are asking, and it also um, resonates uh, to, to what you just said, Alessia, with regard to values. And it's the question of standard settings and norms, a little bit more on the technical side side, but non nonetheless, the EU has always been a strong standard setter. And the question is, is this something where the EU can be more assertive on technical standards for digitalization for artificial intelligence? And I would like to ask um, John and then um, Alessia on this point before we go into a closing round um, with all of you. So. Um, John, what, what do you say? Standard setting, the EU as a standard setting power? Well, I think we need to perhaps distinguish between the discussion here about the Brussels effect and the power of the single market to effectively lead foreign players, even if they are digital monopolists, for instance, to adopt and propagate European standards from technical standardization as it has happened in many of the existing digital technologies over the past few decades, which is a fundamentally transnational process. So this has not been a case, even with mobile networking, for example, where the key networking body actually originated as a European initiative of Europe defining the standards in isolation and then exporting them or having them exported by proxy to the rest of the world. It has been a matter of companies from all over the world um, participating on an equal footing. Um, to develop 
common standards which are now quite hard to unravel. So if we were to use 5G as an example, there's a lot of discussion about open architecture, for example, especially here in Germany at the moment, um, as an alternative um, to so-called open RAN. Some people may have heard the term to uh, Huawei, essentially, and proprietary solutions. But the problem of that, of course, is that open RAN is based on underlying standards, um, which have been stacked back over decades, in which Chinese companies were major contributors. Um, and in fact, uh, in the open RAN standardization process, you still have participation by a great many many Chinese firms. So the standardization discussion needs to account, I think, for the fact that at least the way it's been done so far for the last few decades has been in a collaborative, depoliticized context. And part of the challenges, of course, are that China does have a very directive national approach to standardization. So it does have strategic goals. It does support participation by its companies um, and some would say um, coordinated behavior by its companies in these open international forums. But that doesn't change the fact that they are basically open international forums. And if we want to come up with a model which excludes Chinese participation entirely, that means basically changing the forums and the entire infrastructure by which standardization is done. Um, but again, uh, just in the interest of time, uh, I might leave to my colleagues here to add their views. Alessia, please. Well, there's nothing much to add to what John said. The standard setting is the new power. It's the power of the future. No, no wonder China wants to be the first pioneering standard setting on digital uh, technologies and on the platforms. And now on fintech as well, which is another you know chapter very very relevant, because then you know the, when the scale increases up to a certain point, then um, you know uh, economies of scale are such that other countries, third countries, tend to be locked into another system, and this is what China is actually pursuing not only in, on digital technology, but also on other technologies in the past. Um, um, so uh, regulating first um, with the aim of having uh, our own digital sovereignty is, is, is of course very urgent, but with also in, in a view of having a, our data and you know information protected, but also with a view that, as you know, Niels was saying, digital and technical decoupling is not feasible. Well, that that that's going that's going to be a very sharp line between systems, and there are going to be possibly three systems. Uh, who knows? But you know, the world is very small after all, so there's not so much room for three different digital systems so and then it's a matter of power so if we want and back again to values and norms and standards if we want to stick to the rules we need to set our own rules but no, in, not so as to jeopardize our own system as usually has been the case in the past uh, but to actually have our own standards to be able to set on a table to 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 discuss and negotiate with other systems, but don't, not having a system is not a way forward, because the other parts are having their own system, very strong system, not very open system. I mean, you are in or out. This is not openness. Um, this is out out. It's very different. So. Thank you. So uh, the regulations in Europe are very urgent, are the basic for everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as a prerequisite for the EU um, being a soft power and uh, being assertive, unfortunately, we have to come to our last round. And I want to um, ask you to put on your thinking head and, your, and use your imagination. Um, imagine there is another EU-China summit coming up on tech issues and you are writing the declaration um, which both of them, the partners, are going to sign in the end. What would you say need to be the top three priorities to be addressed in such an EU-China tech declaration? And I would like to start with you, uh, Niels.
have to unmute myself. Um, well, I, um, it, it's not an easy question, but I, I think um, if I may sideline a little bit um, your plea for three topics, um, let me just say that I believe we need to come to reciprocity as a general principle. Mm. That has not always been the case. And I mentioned um, how open uh, Germany, but also in, in general, the European markets have been, which has been of great benefit. And when you mentioned also the, the, the danger of falling back to protectionist um, uh, measures and trends, which is certainly realistic. Um, so I, I think we need to need to come to a clear uh, agreement with China uh, that uh, you know we want to have a good cooperation. Uh, we, we need to have an acceptable regulatory framework um, for everybody, and uh, that but that we are not willing to accept anymore the game that they are playing. You know, using their enormous market power on the one hand side. On, on the other hand side, in these kind of negotiations, always uh, relying on their statue as a developing country. That's not going to work in the future. So we need reciprocity, acceptance, market access, uh, a fair um, level playing field. I believe that's what's at stake here. Thank you so much, Niels. Um, Svenja, over to you. Your three most pertinent issues for a tech EU-China declaration. Um, well, there are certainly a lot of issues. If I should limit it to three aspects, it's definitely on cybersecurity, um, on forced data exchange of European companies as forced through China, uh, because this is, of course, as well an aspect of, well, uh, secrets, uh, trade secrets, as well as, um, yeah. Uh, stepping it up. And uh, third, I think, usage cases framework of AI. Thank you but there's so much. so much more. But those would be like I know, three things limiting but... it down. <laughs> I, yeah, absolutely. But limiting it to those, those are very pressing right now. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, uh, John, your take. Well, uh, I would also, by preference, cheat and <laughs> nominate a single issue, but um, I will have a go at three. Though, again, uh, I would prioritize one, and that would be finding common ground on international public goods. And there, again, if we look at um, the Internet as a global public good, which provides certain services in common to everyone, um, I think it's possible to get around, to some extent, the differences which will not be resolved, um, perhaps in the transatlantic context, but I'm very skeptical um, in a global context and certainly not with China over values. Um, so to some extent, if they can be compartmentalized, those issues, and we can focus on the need to keep the Internet running as a piece of infrastructure which provides shared goods to everyone in the world, then that's at least the basis for some outcomes um, that might provide the goodwill for further discussions. Um, if I had to nominate two other issues, then I would agree with Representative Han that um, international data exchanges are perhaps the most pressing. Um, and here again, uh, I have to put this in context um, that the digital component of international trade, of course, is rising rapidly. Um, we've already seen in the context of um, the uh, transatlantic space, how a decision like that in the Schrems II judgment um, can create great uncertainty for businesses and uh, for policymakers, um, even within the transatlantic community, never mind um, within the larger global context. Um, and then for the final issue, I agree that artificial intelligence um, will be important, um, but uh, I would also encourage um, to again. Uh, the audience um, and my fellow colleagues to bear in mind that um, the hard physical technologies um, underlying all of this digital infrastructure um, not only are very important, but have been in some ways the focus of the adversarial measures that have been taken so far. So if you look at the actual decoupling measures, the export controls that have been put in place by the United States over the last few years, for example, they haven't really been in the field of artificial intelligence um, and regulation of algorithms so far. They have been very much on um, targeting semiconductors because there are choke points in a well-established and mature supply chain which you can target. And that is already creating great disruption um, 
or contributing at least to it on a global scale, as we've seen with the auto industry here in Europe and the global shortage of processing chips. Thank you so much um, for also mentioning the uh, issue of export controls. That was one of the questions we hadn't tackled so far. So um, last but not least, um, Alessia, you three, your three priorities. Well, it's not easy being last on this. Uh, I have only one, a big one. And this is, as Europeans, we are entitled. And uh, maybe we have a right to uh, put on the table the, uh, say, fight of monopolies on digital platforms. The US has, China has, Europe doesn't. So this is a very big, big issue of course they won't agree but we are the only one entitled to you know uh, actually uh, ask for not having uh, monopolies on digital platform because this is the very you know field where the actual competition will be will be happening uh, once you know millions of people are locked into a platform then we know what happens so and this goes back to the question before so uh, prevent and work against monopolies and digital platforms i think is the issue Thank you. So, thank you so much um, to all of our four speakers. Unfortunately, our time is up. Um, I'm not surprised that we did talk a lot about European strategic sovereignty or autonomy. Um, you can't get around this issue when you talk about EU-US relations and EU-China relations and digital issues. And what I learned today is sovereignty certainly does not, does not mean do it or go it alone. I learned that sovereignty also does not mean closing yourself off or protectionism. Um, I also learned today that sovereignty requires EU unity and sovereignty also needs assertiveness and that we don't let ourselves be pushed around. And um, as Alessia also told us and reminded us, sovereignty also means that we shouldn't underestimate ourselves. But at the same time, we need to see where our weaknesses are, um, where we have to do investment and where we do have to do more. There are so many more open questions, but this has not been or is not going to be the last digital dish we are doing. So please join us again um, at our next uh, digital dish. Uh, thank you so much again um, to our strong partner Telefonica. We love to do these events with you. And I have to say the technical setup was amazing. Um, and I would like to do this again with you. And thank you so much to our four speakers again, um, to Niels, to Svenja, to Alessia and um, also to John. I am very sure that our um, that the EU-China relationship lies in good hands with such good and strong negotiators um, as well as such great experts on um, China and EU-China relations. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your knowledge and your experience with us. And I would say this is going to be continued. Thank you so much for our audience for joining us today um, and for asking these excellent questions. I hope to see you soon. Until then, I always say stay healthy and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much to everybody.